Well, hello. Lovely to see you. If you're visiting or new here and don't know me, my name's Kenny. Um, I'm one of the leaders here. And it's a joy to be with you this Good Friday. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time in that passage in Matthew's Gospel. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this chance to come to reflect on the death of your Son for us. Father, today, as we read and think about um, this part of Matthew, give us a sense of awe and wonder um, at what Jesus did for us. Amen. And, well, as we come to this passage, it, there's a question I have for you, which is this. What, sort, what kind of things make a good king, a good queen, or even a good leader? It's an interesting question at the moment, isn't it? Especially with what's going on around us in the world politically. But what do we look for in our leaders? If you spend some time looking at the kind of things people say you want in a good king or a good leader, you get things like they're efficient, they can get things done, they're good communicators, they can talk to people, they can draw people with them, they can help people understand what's happening. They're visionaries, they have a picture of what they want and what would be good. They are, or at least they seem to be, in control of things. They're a role model to look up to, someone that people would like to follow. People say they want wise or successful leaders. And if you're talking about actual kings, then military prowess gets added in too. You get the picture though, don't you? When we think about kings or leaders in some capacity, you get a picture of someone with all the answers, who can stand at the front of somewhere, who can cast a vision, someone who gets things done, someone who looks the part. So here's my question for us. Do we sometimes want a leader, a guru, or a king who's more like that than the Jesus we see here in Matthew's Gospel? Or perhaps we sometimes wish that Jesus himself had been a bit more like that kind of king or leader. If I'm honest, sometimes I do. Because, you know, when life is hard or overwhelming, what sort of king do you want? You want someone who's going who's to fix it, who's going to grab things by the reins for me, or at least tell me what to do and show me how to do it. When we feel weak or threatened or vulnerable, what sort of king or leader do we want? Often we want someone who can fix it, don't we? Who looks like they've got it sorted and made it. Feeling overwhelmed in family life, we look to someone who seems to have it sorted, who seems to know how to do it all, and we follow after them. Jen and I were reading a book um, on parenting not that long ago. In the introduction, as you read it, you realize this person was saying, basically, follow me, do what I do, and everything will be all right. It will be sorted. I've got it sorted. Do as I say, do as I do, just follow me. And you'll have this perfect family too. We look for people like that. And we make them, if we're not careful, our kings. Those we follow. We don't so much use those words, but it is what we end up doing. We follow them. We honour them before others. We lift them up. We look at them. We read their books. We share their blog posts. We do what they do and what they suggest. But as we look at Matthew this Good Friday... We see that Jesus is so different. It's what we often look for. And he is so much better. It's not necessarily that he's none of those things, but he recasts what it means to be those things. He's the one who does live out life in a way that no one else can. He is the kind of king that we really need for every facet of life. He's not the kind of king that commands the troops from a distance. It's not the kind of king who came to be served and build himself up, but the one who came to serve. He's not like a king or a leader who just tells us how to live a better life and what to do, or simply shows us how to live one. But he's actually the kind of king that lived a perfect life for us, because we can't. Yet this is the kind of king, this is the king that nobody seemed to want. This is the king that everybody rejected. The king that nobody even wanted to really to associate with. But Jesus was the king that they all needed. He is the king that we all need. And as we read, 
this, to be honest, pretty horrific account of Jesus' treatment and his crucifixion. Could we leave today just wanting Jesus as king that little bit more than it's been a good Friday? We're going to focus today as we look at this long passage of Matthew on the things that everybody says about Jesus. You see, after weeks, we've had weeks in Matthew now of everybody lying about Jesus, everybody trying to deny the truth about Jesus. Well, today, everybody starts to tell the truth, even if it's in mockery or hate. So first, the soldiers, it's in verse 29 and 37, if you've got the passage in front of you. The soldiers, they say, and they do, more than I think they could possibly know. The scene is pretty horrific as we start, isn't it? You've got probably hundreds of soldiers gathered around this one solitary man. They strip him, then they dress him up as a mock king. They put a robe on him, they give him a staff to hold, they make a crown of thorns, they kneel down and they pretend to worship him. Listen to what Matthew says. He says, they stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him. The point is this, they're going, aren't they? They're going, what sort of king are you? You're not a king, we have all the power. Who really wants to worship you? Jesus, he doesn't look here, does he, like the picture of a king or a leader or a ruler. He looks weak, he looks like a failure, he looks like a criminal. But listen to the soldiers' words in verse 29. Listen to what they actually say. They say this, Hail, King of the Jews. And then later when they take him out to crucify him, a sign above his head reads, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They speak far more truth than they know. What they see as mocking, as laughable, as impossible, is the reality. Jesus is the king of God's people. He is the one who is leading God's people. He is the one who is not stood from the sidelines determining the strategy for others to follow, but he is stepping forward in this moment into the battle for his people. He is fighting the battle for them that they cannot win. As Jesus is mocked, as he is beaten, as he is crucified, he doesn't look like the king that everybody wanted. Perhaps he doesn't look like the king we would want. But he is the king we need. Listen to the crowds, the scribes, the other prisoners. Listen to what they say to him. They say, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And then they carry on, don't they? He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts God. Let him deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Second thing the people say, he saved others. He cannot save himself. If you want us to believe that you're the king, then show us. Save yourself. Come down. Then we'll believe. Show us that you look like a king and not a criminal. Then we'll believe. If you want us to believe that you're the son of God, then let God rescue you. Then we'll know. But much like the soldiers, they say much more than they know. He saved others. He cannot save himself. But Jesus knows that if, if he saves himself, then he cannot save anyone else. In this moment, it is us, or it is him. And he chooses to save us, not himself. If you've been with us through the many, many years we've been in Matthew's Gospel now, and we are coming to the end of it, you might find these words resonate somewhere back in the recesses of your mind. So we've heard very, words very much like this before. All the way back in Matthew 4, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, where Satan is stood there tempting Jesus to turn from his mission for himself. 
And as Jesus hangs on the cross that first Good Friday, there is a battle going on. Will Jesus be the king that we all need, who sacrifices himself for us, who dies in our place, who takes the punishment we deserve? Or will he give in? Will he save himself and leave us to face God's wrath? Satan, he failed to stop Jesus right at the beginning of his ministry. But the battle is still being fought here through the words of those that surround Jesus. Come down, they say. If you're the king, act like it. If you're God's son, then show us. Then we'll worship you. Then we'll believe. Then we'll follow you. If you look like a king, if you look like God's son, we will follow you. But this is the picture. This is the picture of the king we all need. This is what a true king looks like, hanging on a cross in order to save us. Hearing and rejecting the temptation to come down for the cross for us. He is the king of Israel, so he stayed on the cross. He trusted in God, so he died on the cross. This is the king we all need. We don't need the kind of king in our lives that we often think. The kind of king who fits the mold of the world's kings. You know, God's people, they have always, all through the Bible, all through time, they've always been drawn to kings and leaders like the world around them. Those who exude that kind of confidence and strength and power and authority, control in a very conventional sense. Who often, let's be honest, gain from it, gain wealth, power and prestige. But so often aren't we drawn to them? Perhaps because our connection with them, it it can be good for our own reputation and sense of self. You know how it is, if you're in the right circles, have the right connections, you assimilate some of that feeling towards a leader or a group for yourself. If an organisation has a certain reputation and profile, if you work for them, you get associated with it. Same with churches, same with leaders, same with kings. We're drawn to them sometimes because somewhere in us we want to go on the same journey as them, reach that same height that they have, Well, Jesus, he was a different kind of king. Here, he exudes strength, control, and power, but in a very different way. Not for his own gain, not to look good, not to strengthen and build himself, but for others, for us. He looks weak. He looks forsaken. He looks cursed. He is a king who goes down to the depths for us. And this is the kind of king we all need. The next saying in this passage is what Jesus himself says. Those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again and yielded up his spirit. God's judgment poured out on Jesus. The judgment we deserve. The death in our place. Darkness, it covers the land from about midday till 3 p.m. A common Old Testament sign of God's judgment being poured out. Can you imagine it? I still remember that brief, brief moment of darkness and the cold the unnatural, odd cold in the last very brief solar eclipse we had. Almost an unnatural darkness that kind of descended and the temperature just plummeted as the sun was taken away. This was no solar eclipse. It lasted three hours as the light from the earth was extinguished, as the light of the world died the light of the world fell under God's judgment. The light goes, the earth shakes, and God's judgment comes down. But on him, not on us. This is the Jesus who knew no sin, made sin for us. Our king takes his, our place and hangs on the cross. He is forsaken, so we are not. A king who gives up his own life for his people. 
Isn't that, in reality, the kind of king we all really want? When all is said and done, when we lift our eyes from our immediate circumstances, the things going on and taking the bigger sweep of life. A king like Jesus, Jesus still in control here. It says he yielded up his spirit. He gave it up. He let it go. He chose to die for us, crucified as a criminal, a God-forsaken death. And as he died there, two things happen, don't they? The temple is replaced as the way and the route to God, and death itself is defeated. As Jesus dies on the cross, we're told that the curtain temple is torn in two from top to bottom. All that mockery about Jesus destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days. Well, this is that. But Jesus said that they would destroy the temple. They would destroy the temple. And in some ways they have. They've destroyed Jesus' body. But in doing so, they make a new way. A new way that we can come to God through him. The old temple, it isn't needed anymore. Because there is a new temple, a new way to God. Jesus himself. He is the means by which we can now come to God. Jesus is the way to God. Then there's the slightly weird bit with the tombs and the saints who had died wandering about the streets of Jerusalem. I think Matthew's trying to show us here that in some wonderful way that Jesus' death was a death in our place. Death can't hold God's people anymore. These saints, they had died. They were in their tombs, sealed tombs. And death, it has always been a sign, hasn't it, of God's judgment, all the way back to Genesis 3. So if you find yourself ever asking the question, if you really do need Jesus as your king, then death gives you the answer you need. No other king has or can die in your place. No other king can rescue you from death itself. When the tombs, when they crack, when they open, the saints, God's people, they're no longer constrained by death. Why? Because there has been a death in their place. They are free from death's chains. Yes, they aren't raised until after Jesus. They stay in the grave until Sunday. And who knows what on earth it would have been like wandering around Jerusalem to have met some of these people. But in that moment that Jesus dies, the tombs have been broken open. And that leads to our last saying. The soldiers watching cry out, don't they? Truly, this was the Son of God. From mocking to believing. They see all the signs of God's judgment being poured out, and even they, in that moment, they realize who Jesus is. Truly, certainly, definitely, this really, really was the Son of God. They're mimicking the disciples back in Matthew 14, who when Jesus asked them who he was, they said, truly, you are the Son of God. By the time Jesus died on that cross, even those who'd been mocking him, realized who he really was. God's son, the king of God's people. Jesus is the king you need. But do you want him? Will you have him? One of the things I love about Easter, and perhaps Good Friday in particular, is despite in some ways it being a dark day, a day when the innocent son of God was crucified by people just like us, for us. It's also a day, isn't it, amongst the whole year that reminds us of the most important things in our lives. It's easy week by week as we go through the motions to lose sight of what Jesus has done for us. There are so many other false kings calling us to follow them, calling us to do what they do, appealing to our desires and our needs, saying, follow after me, then you'll be satisfied. Give your life to this cause or purpose, then you will find real meaning. Well, Easter reminds me every year that we need none of that. Because Jesus has given us what we need most. Life. A renewed relationship with God. He has drank the cup of God's wrath so we can drink the cup of his blessing. We already have a king to follow. Nailed to a cross, he didn't look much like other kings of this world. He didn't look like someone who had succeeded in life. He was a man hung on a cross, a God-forsaken death, but killed 
for those he loved, for those he came to save, for those who would be his people, for you, for me. He is our king, and he calls us to follow him, to use the new life that he has won for us, the life we now have because he gave up his life in our place. This is where we will find the life that satisfies. This is where we'll find the life that is good and that is worth living. But it is a cross-shaped life, following our king. Let me finish here. There are always going to be people calling out for you to follow them, whether in person, through books, through other media. But Jesus calls you to follow him, to have him as your king. And he died for you. He gave up his life for you so that you could have a new and eternal life in God's presence. He, in that moment he died, he paid for all the wrong you've done. He covered over the shame and welcomed you home. Can any other king or any other leader or any other guru do that? Following Jesus as king isn't always easy, but he is the only one worth following. And every year, Good Friday reminds us of that. We'll have a moment of quiet and the musicians are going to come on. They're going to play, they're going to do two songs. The first one is just a chance to reflect um, as the musicians play and sing on the words we've heard, the words that will be sung. And then for the second song, we'll stand up um, after that and join in together. But just a moment to reflect. <laughs>